welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. We've made it to the end of 2019, but before we get too far into 2020, let's take a look back at the science from December. Let's start this off with our YouTube series, The Life Extend Show. As you may know from last month, The Life Extend Show has a new co-host, Vera. This month, Vera hosted an episode providing a fairly detailed breakdown of epigenetic alterations and their role in aging. Here's what that sounded like. As you've probably been told tons of times in biology classes, your genome tells each of your cells what type of a cell it is and what its job is. But it's been known for a while now that this is not the whole story. After all, every last cell in your body has the exact same set of genes. So how is it possible that brain cells, for example, look nothing like muscle cells and do very different jobs? The answer is, it's complicated, ridiculously so. And it has important implications for human health and, you guessed it, aging. Epigenetics is defined as the changes to the traits of an organism that are not caused by alterations to its genetic code. Rather, alterations happen on top of the genetic code, at least metaphorically. And indeed, that's what the Greek prefix epi stands for. There are different types of epigenetic changes, but loosely speaking, they can all be imagined as the state change of a switch that can turn genes on and off. Genes encode for proteins, but the protein encoded by a gene is produced only if the gene is expressed, that is, when it's switched on. These gene switches are referred to as epigenome, which, unlike the genome, is not supposed to stay put. Rather, it can and does change, depending on a variety of circumstances. For example, changes in gene expression are common during physiological development, when unspecialized cells need to turn into specific tissue, such as heart or liver. External and environmental factors can also influence gene expression. Smoking, for example, can flip genes on and off, and generally not in a good way. As if smoking ever did anything good for you. And so can chronic stress. Different types of switches can activate or deactivate genes. DNA methylation is one way to turn genes off, and it happens when the cell places a chemical called a methyl group onto a segment of the DNA. Genetic code is read by a microscopic molecular machine called polymerase, which zips along the strand. When a methyl group is placed on top of a gene within the strand, this can prevent polymerase from accessing and reading the gene. Another switch that involves attaching a chemical group is histone acetylation, which is kind of the reverse of DNA methylation. DNA is generally wound around a myriad of tiny spools called histones. Acetylation happens when the cell places an acetyl group on a histone, which has the effect of loosening the DNA coils around the spool, allowing the polymerase to more easily access the genes than it could before acetylation. The sort of beads on a string structure we've described thus far may sound complicated enough as it is, but it gets worse. The ensemble of DNA and histones folds on itself into a sort of spaghetti-like tangle, with some portions being more tight and others being more loose. The loose portions, called euchromatin, are the active part of the genome of a cell, which is the part that can be expressed to make proteins, whereas the tight parts, called heterochromatin, are silent. The correct folding of DNA into active and inactive parts is crucially important for the functioning of cells. Euchromatin and heterochromatin are different in different cell types, which means that cells of a given type have the same active portion of DNA, which encodes specifically for the proteins that are needed by cells of that type. However, 
anything in biology that can go wrong generally tends to do so. And it has been observed that over time, the neatly organized compartmentalization of euchromatin and heterochromatin becomes not so neat anymore. Genes that were supposed to be silenced become active and vice versa, causing cells to malfunction. Some progeroid syndromes, conditions that look a lot like aging, like Werner syndrome and Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome, present abnormalities in these organization mechanisms, which reinforces the view that improper division between euchromatin and heterochromatin might play a role in cellular aging. Aging seems to be accompanied by all kinds of epigenetic alterations that switch on genes that should be switched off, and vice versa. And they appear to drive other hallmarks of aging like cell senescence and mitochondrial dysfunction. This may sound pretty bad, but don't despair yet. Hopefully, we might be able to sort out this mess. Remember that unlike your genome, your epigenome can and does change. This means that it may be possible to eliminate epigenetic alterations and return your epigenome to a healthy state. Kind of like hitting the reset switch to revert back to manufacturer settings. As a matter of fact, this has already been done. Well, in mice, not people. But we gotta start somewhere. Scientists at the Salk Institute managed to reset the epigenome of mice suffering from progeria by exposing them to a cocktail of four very special chemicals called Yamanaka factors. Originally created by Professor Shinya Yamanaka in 2006, this cocktail is capable of turning specialized cells back into unspecialized stem cells. Essentially, Yamanaka factors make cells forget what their job and identity is. However, while this is very useful as a means of creating stem cells, turning all your cells back into stem cells isn't very advisable because they would no longer have any idea what they're supposed to do. Still, given that the procedure turns specialized cells back into stem cells, you might suspect that this somehow rejuvenates them. And in fact, that's exactly what was proven by Salk Institute scientists in 2016. Salk researchers administered the Yamanaka factors to cells from mice with progeria, but only for a short period. The result was that the cell's epigenetics were reset back to a younger state, but the cells didn't forget their identity or job. They just had a younger epigenetic profile. The researchers took this a step further and tried the same technique in live progeroid mice. Compared to the non-treated controls, treated mice lived 30% longer and showed improvements in the tissues of different organs such as the stomach, spleen, kidney, and skin, as well as improved vascular and cardiac activity. The scientists also observed improved pancreatic function, as well as better muscular regenerative capacity in the mice exposed to the Yamanaka factors. There's definitely reasons to be enthusiastic for these results, but let's keep in mind that they were observed in mice with artificially induced aging, not in people. There is potential but we're still some way before being able to do the same in humans. In any case, we'll keep an eye on this area of research, and we'll let you know about future developments. The full video version features some additional information, as well as visuals that we won't get on the podcast. It also features some hilarious outtakes and bloopers. You can catch the full video, as well as other talks and episodes of the Life Extend show, on our YouTube channel. Visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup for more information. And now for a research roundup. According to a new study published by researchers in California, 10-hour time-restricted eating reduces weight and blood pressure in patients with metabolic syndrome. To quote the study, in animal models, time-restricted feeding can prevent and reverse aspects of metabolic diseases, and time-restricted eating in human pilot studies reduces the risks of metabolic diseases in otherwise healthy individuals. The researchers took this a step further and found this time-restricted eating intervention improves cardiometabolic health for patients with metabolic syndrome. A new study from Spanish researchers suggests that harmful changes to the population and diversity of our gut bacteria may occur when we're as young as our mid-30s, which can have serious implications for health and longevity. These changes include alteration not only to the population and diversity of our gut bacteria, but also to the various compounds they produce. More research is needed 
but it is plausible that better health as we age can be supported via interventions focused on the microbiome. Speaking of the microbiome, tryptophan is an amino acid that is naturally produced in the gut microbiome, and inadequate levels of it may result in reduced levels of NAD along with inflammation. A paper recently released by Frontiers in Immunology explores the potential of a ratio involving tryptophan as a biomarker of inflammation and discusses how intervening in tryptophan metabolism might extend health and lifespan. The idea that the microbiome might be manipulated in order to promote health and potentially longevity is an interesting one. And there are multiple ways in which tryptophan levels in particular might be increased. The direct delivery of tryptophan is plausible, provided it can get beyond the gut and liver to reach the target cells. Fecal transplants or probiotics are also a possibility in order to increase the population of bacteria that produce tryptophan. Normally, as cells become damaged beyond repair, they are removed from the body via a process known as apoptosis. This system acts as a safety net to prevent damaged cells from remaining active. Unfortunately, as we age, this disposal system begins to slow. This leads to the accumulation of unwanted senescent cells in the body, and this buildup of senescent cells is one of the proposed reasons we age and has been the focus of intense research in the past few years. According to newly published research, treatments that remove senescent cells can both have an immediate benefit from a reduced senescent cell load and a longer-term benefit from increased senescent cell removal. For more updates in longevity science, visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. And now for some news nuggets. A team of researchers, including Dr. Alex Zavarankov of Insilico Medicine, has published a review paper that gives an overview of the use of deep learning, a subset of machine learning based on artificial neural networks, to help advance life extension science. According to the paper, deep learning systems trained on the many measurable features changing in time can generalize and learn the many biological processes on the population and individual levels. The deep age predictors can help advance aging research by establishing causal relationships in nonlinear systems. Deep aging clocks can be used for identification of novel therapeutic targets, evaluating the efficacy of various interventions, prediction of health trajectories, mortality, and many other applications. DNA testing company Veritas Genetics has unexpectedly announced the suspension of its U.S. operations. The company, co-founded by Harvard professor George Church, had offered a full genome sequencing for under $600. This announcement only impacts its U.S. operations, however, as it will continue to operate in China, Latin America, and Europe, and has vowed to continue its mission of driving down the cost of genome sequencing. Now available on our website is an interview with Professor Brian Kennedy of the National University of Singapore. Professor Kennedy's work is focused on understanding the biology underlying the aging process and developing therapies that can delay, prevent, and treat aging and the diseases that come with it. It's fairly well known that senescent cells are considered highly relevant to the aging process and the onset of chronic disease, but an international team of researchers recently attempted to discover more about the accumulation of senescent cells in human tissue. In doing so, they've put together a readily understandable digest for anyone curious about senescent cells and their impact on human health. Their work was published by Aging Cell and can be accessed, along with the rest of the updates here, at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. That's it for the final episode of 2019 of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Music